governments, right? So you just do whatever you want. Right now, you're closely aligned, I think, with what public convention wants, so I'm going to say you're a public convention club, even though, you know, two years from now, you might not be, or you might not want to be, what, you know, whatever. Um, so the open source community is very loose in, in that way, right? You don't need a charter or anything to, to create such a thing. Um, and I have, a, I have a YouTube channel, and we make really good YouTube videos, and very few people watch them. So I would like to ask you all to subscribe to my YouTube channel. <laughs> we put a lot of work into that, and we've only got 200 subscribers. Right now. Okay, so I, I mentioned this before. There's actually a long history in America of what I would call public invention, but it's better articulated now than it ever has been before. Okay, believe it or not, Benjamin Franklin, who um, some people, there, there was a book called The First American. They, they called Benjamin Franklin the first American because he was actually in England and France acting as the ambassador for the, the American Re Revolution. You know? And he, at the time, he was the most famous American because of his scientific work. He was the only American whose name would be well known in Europe before the, before the revolution. Um, he, did not patent the famous Franklin stove. And he intentionally did that because he believed everyone should have the benefit of it. Okay. Now, some things, some tales grow a little taller than the telling. Okay. So it's actually the case that someone else made an improvement to the Franklin stove that made it much more practical. <laughs> and Benjamin Franklin owned the newspapers and he may have gotten some <laughs> PR benefit from not patenting it and so forth. As always, you can always question the motives of some doing something. Truly the first American. Nonetheless, he didn't patent it, and he said he didn't patent it to give it as a gift to the whole world, because of course back then, you got the, the Franklin stove is basically a tube that heats the air before it goes down and comes back into your room. And at that time, that was a tremendous energy saving and money saving invention, because fuel was very expensive and it was very hard to heat. So it, it was a big deal, right? Um, even if it required some other people to make improvements before it could really be manufactured. Similarly, Buckminster Fuller and Jonas Salk were more or less contemporaries of each other. Um, you guys probably know Jonas Salk was the Jewish inventor of the polio vaccine. And in the um, current universe of COVID-19, it's, it, it's, it's important to remember what that was like, okay? In the early 50s, parents didn't let their kids play with other kids because they were afraid of polio. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, although it was not known at the time because the press treated it very differently, was paralyzed from the waist down, mostly because of polio. I went to graduate school with an Indian gentleman who walked with a limp because of polio, from India. Polio has been eradicated in the United States. It's still not eradicated worldwide, close to eradicated. Um, Jonas Salk did not patent the polio vaccine because it was too big a deal. And when he did this, when the first trial succeeded and they, the FDA said, we, we can have this, there were ticker tape parades in New York for Jonas Salk. Like, he was a tremendous hero. And the, the whole process was, everyone just breathed a tremendous sigh of relief. Okay. Sadly, I'm not sure we treated COVID exactly the same way. You know? um, no, nonetheless, that's the case. Now, Buckminster Fuller is the person, Jonas Salk also wrote a book about these kinds of ideas, but Buckminster Fuller, to me, is a person who championed it more. He was born in 1895, and he died in 1983, the year I graduated from high school. Uh, so I never met him during his life, but he, he wrote a number of books. And more than anyone else, he um, described what I consider to be a very uniquely American kind of motivation for um, inventing in the public interest. And his, his most famous invention is the geodesic dome, which was an attempt to build cheap shelter for people, okay? It was not very successful at housing, but it was very successful at building things like giant stadiums uh, and, and so forth. Um, and, and he talked a lot about this, this philosophy. Now, um, today there is a person living named Richard Stallman, who is a somewhat controversial uh, figure. 
He has been the champion of the Free Software Foundation and open source software movement. Um, and uh, he has talked about software freedom, the, the freedom to utilize and share software as fundamental in kind of the same way that freedom and liberty have, have been a part of the American consciousness. Right? So um, he's been a very strong advocate of that. My personal opinion is, I'll put down my Um, my personal opinion is that Richard Stallman made something happen in software that I'd like to make happen in hardware. Now, this makes perfect sense because it's much easier to make free software than it is to make free hardware. Okay, as Richard Stallman would tell you, we can both run the same program at zero cost, but we can't both eat the same sandwich. Physical things have a limitation. So the word free hardware is, makes no sense. You can't have free of cost hardware, but you can have free as in free speech hardware. You can have the right to modify your hardware and, and so forth. Okay. Well, basically, it's easy to provide freedom for text. You can share a book. Open, MIT has open courseware, Yale has open courseware. For all I know, Alvin publishes a lot of open material. It's easy to do it with software. A little bit harder because more labor goes into it, but if you have a computer, you can contribute to open source software. No capital costs involved beyond the cost of a computer and, and whatever it takes to educate your brain, right? Any hardware, even these simple little things here that are not terribly impressive, the cost is much, much higher. Okay, like that robot, the parts cost of $2,000. We probably spent $8,000 with all the stuff that broke and crap and tools and things that we didn't write. That's a lot more expensive if you're like the graduates, and $8,000 for hobby level is pretty high. Okay, that creates a barrier to entry. But my belief is over time, these barriers to entries are getting lower for everybody. One example of that is 3D printing. 3D printing today is a little bit janky, but it just didn't exist 20 years ago, or it only existed in the last 20 years. There's no way you can do the, the things that we're doing. Now. So the cost of min making many hardware things has decreased almost to the level of sort of software level. Not exactly, because you still have to have matter, you still have to have, have the machines. Um, and then finally, I'm now, because of the pandemic, working on medical devices. And that's another layer of expense. It's, it's like an order of magnitude harder because basically you have to have FDA regulation. And I don't want to talk about that too much except to say that um, we're not ducking the issue. Okay, we are attempting to build devices which someday will save someone's life, even though none of the devices I'm going to show you today are appropriate for that. But making something which, which is approved by the US FDA or the European regulatory bodies, the, the analogous ones in other nations, is super, super difficult in terms of the level of paperwork and care um, which is required. But we, we can do it. We are pioneering that. That has really never been done before. Okay, And even in hardware today, when you say open source hardware, what most people actually mean is open source chip design. That's what the word open source hardware mostly means. I would like 20 years from now for the word open source hardware, or as Richard Stallman prefers to say, free design hardware, to have a bigger footprint than it does today. Okay, so this is what I would like to have happen. Okay, in the past, if you look at America since World War II, there have been two major forces that have driven technological development, for-profit firms and universities. Okay, you guys are at universities, okay? We, we understand IBM, Xerox, Kodak, uh, uh, now Google, the, for, you know, the things in Silicon Valley, they have a strong incentive to develop this. So Tesla would be probably a better example, right? Because they're, they're spending money on hardware, right? Um, and universities, of course, are a great sense of research as well. Okay. 
There's always been public invention, as I said, since the time of Benjamin Franklin, there's been public invention. But it's been tiny compared to what universities and uh, for-profit firms have done, okay? And then there's been the maker movement, okay? Now, the maker movement is, is part of what public invention should be. It's the idea of democratizing and empowering people to make things, but divorced from the idea that you have a moral responsibility to make anything. Okay, so the classic examples, and, and I'm, I'm really down on this, forgive me, but you know, if I see one more toy lightsaber <laughs> or TARDIS earrings being printed on in a maker space, I'm gonna puke. I'm just tired. Don't, don't go into any of our bedrooms. Like. I'm tired of the entire <laughs> maker movement making toys, right? That, like it's all about cool factor and, and so forth. And that's good if it motivates people. But it's time for the maker movement to grow up and to start doing what it's really capable of, which is to build a better world for all of us. And I really believe if we could take 3% of the energy that goes into the maker movement today and divert it to helping people in the world, either through research or just by building things that are useful, we, we could really change the world. So what I hope is that 10 years from now, public invention will be a rival to universities and for-profit firms. Now, I use the word public invention not to mean my little organization, which has a budget of about $40,000 a year. My organization is not going to do that. But public invention as a movement, as an idea that other people support, may actually be able to do that. I say it's optimistic to say it's going to happen in six years. I wrote this slide a while ago. But eventually, I kind of believe we're going to move to a world where that is possible. Okay, I'm going to cut this a little bit short. Um, so now I'd like to kind of give you guys some advice that's rolled into this philosophy that, that I have. Um, so a long time ago, Freeman Dyson wrote a book called um, Infinite and All Dimensions. I think that's what it's called. And he advanced something that I really believe, and I, I recommend you read it. Okay. The universe is infinite in its expanse, north, south, east, and west, okay? But more importantly, it's infinite if you look at the grand scale and also if you look down at a microscopic scale, okay? And it's infinite in what you can do in mathematics. It's infinite in what you can do in biology. It's infinite in what you can do in engineering. It's infinite in ecology, for example. The world is full of really interesting problems to be solved. In your lifetime, you will not reach the end of any of these endeavors, okay? If humanity is gonna survive, it's gonna to have to live lightly on the earth, much more so than it is right now. And that means there is an unending supply of very important ecological problems that have to be solved, including, for example, clean energy, stopping global warming, Stopping war, stopping global pandemics. There's a lot, a lot to be done here. And so I think the part of the idea of the of the being a public inventor, and this is not this is not obvious because not everybody believes this, is that the world is full of interesting and useful problems which you can solve. And you have the power to solve them. Although I think many people underestimate how difficult it is, you have the power to be a moral agent in the universe which is going to solve these problems. Okay, so I'd just like to give you guys some advice before we start talking about the equipment that I brought. I brought a lot of little toys, some of which are uh, inoperable. Um, but th these are things that, I, that I, I would like to tell you guys as researchers, and we, we can talk about this more. Um, the first thing is your studies should come first, okay? In the sense that it's, it's important that you make good grades and be successful in school. I believe working on public invention projects can have a lot of benefits for your career and teaching you things personally, but I would not suggest that you do that at the expense of making good grades in school. Um, for those of you in graduate school, you probably understand that. I sometimes give talks to, um, for example, historically black colleges, and, and I want to make it very clear that studies have to come first, you know. 
Um, it takes years to develop judgment. And that's one of the really hard things to get. You can be very smart. You can be a very smart young person, maybe smarter than me, maybe smarter than anybody, but you probably don't have judgment because it takes a long time and a lot of experience to develop. And that judgment is extremely valuable. It takes years for you to de develop it, okay? Um, when I was in graduate school, uh, I, I had the opportunity to speak to a few, a few Turing Prize winners in computer science. I was in the computer science program. The Turing Prize is the equivalent of a Nobel Prize in the, the field of computer science. So I heard a um, debate between Tony Hoare and Edgar Dijkstra. Edgar Dijkstra is on the staff at the University of Texas. Tony Hoare is a British scientist who's famous for being quick short, but he did a lot more. And they were complete opposites. Um, Dijkstra was known as a very annoying, abrasive human being, and Tony Hoare was just the model of an English gentleman. Just by looking at him, he looked like an English gentleman, and he spoke like an English gentleman. Um, but one of the things that Dijkstra always said is that you have to do research in the thin boundary between the impossible and the trivial. Most problems are trivial. Many problems are simply impossible. There's no point in solving and trying to attack an impossible problem. There's no point in solving a trivial problem. It takes great judgment to know where that boundary lies, okay? And I, I don't pretend that I know perfectly, but I, I've been working a long time. I, I have some feel for it. And it takes a while to develop that sense of when a problem is too hard and when a problem is not interesting enough. And that's something I'd, I'd like to help you develop. Another thing to understand, um, there was another gentleman there who had not won a Turing Prize, Professor Ben Kuypers, and he mentioned a book, Advice to a Young Scientist by Peter Medawar. And one of the things that Advice to a Young Scientist points out is that brilliant people do mediocre research. You can be really smart and work for 20 years, and you, you're not necessarily going to get a Nobel Prize because there's a certain amount of luck involved in all research, okay? And you've got to be more like a poker player. You gotta place your bets where you think they're gonna hit, right? There's no certainty in the work that you're doing. If there's certainty in it, it's engineering and not research, right? So from a research point of view, it's important to understand that brilliant people do mediocre research. Why do I include this? Because I've dealt with a lot of undergraduates who overshoot. They try to do something that's not really possible and they get nothing done. So they work for an entire semester on a project and accomplish nothing. And, and I really believe their professors should not allow them to do that. But sometimes it happens. Okay. Um, you need to be brave. And the greatest researchers that I have personally known, of which Edgar Dijkstra would be one, even though he was uh, annoying. Um, the greatest asset they had was that they were incredibly brave. They just didn't care what anyone thought. They didn't care what anyone thought about their research. They weren't following the fashionable trends in research. They were just doing what they were working on, okay? But you also have to be brave enough to be small, okay? You have to be brave enough to say, I'm going to do something small that's just going to be a small addition to the body of research that other people have done. Okay? Being brave doesn't mean trying to do something gigantic. It means selecting something that, that you can really work on based on your ability to do it, not based on what someone else says will be an interesting research topic. You can find original things to do, and you should follow original things to do. But that doesn't mean that you should try to build a time machine or a faster than light drive, because we know those things are not within our grasp, right? There's no way you can make progress on those projects. They're, it's a waste of time to work on things like that. But there may be other things that are not a waste of time that you can think of that I can't think of, or that I might think it's a waste of time. You need to be brave enough to follow your own perception of that. And then you really need to be humble, okay? 
Isaac Newton said, if I have seen further, it's because I stood on the shoulders of giants. That letter was written, I think, in 1675. Um, many young people who go to college have been told a narrative which is counter to this. They've been told that they're brilliant and they can be the lone inventor, the lone scientist working late in a lab by themselves and have a breakthrough and do things by themselves. And it's almost always not true. With the, with the exception of mathematics, and even then it's not true, it's almost always not true. What you do will be a part of a stream and it will have been there before you got there, and it will be carried on after you've got there. And you need to be humble enough to work in that stream and to realize that the best thing you can do is probably just to improve upon something that someone else has done in some way. Um, okay, get to the cold face. Now this, this is an expression that doesn't, may not have that much currency in the, in the United States. Okay. Getting to the coal face means doing the work to get down to the nitty gritty of the problem, okay? A long time ago, particularly in England, you could be a collier, which was a coal miner. And what you did is you took a pick and you walked down into a hole and you just started smacking the side of a coal seam and chunks of coal would fall out and you put them in a cart and picked them back up and you got paid for the coal, okay? That was a major thing that, that people did back when, when coal was necessary. You can't get any coal out until you're standing at the coal face. If you're standing above ground, if, if you don't have the coal in front of you, you can't do anything, okay? Now, when I was a little boy, I wanted to be a scientist. I wanted to be Albert Einstein. I wanted to be Jimmy Neutron. I wanted to you know, do all these things. And my dad said, you can't do that until you get to graduate school. And he was kind of harsh, but there was a truth in what he said. Okay, it's not that you can't do it until you get to graduate school. It's that you can't do it until you've done your homework and you, you, you've reached the limit of human knowledge in whatever field that you're working in. You have to do that homework. You have to spend the time in the library or on Google Scholar learning what you're doing. And then you, you're in a position where you can make an addition to that field. Until you walk down into the hole and get to where the interesting work is, you can't do interesting work, right? So you have a little bit of the work to do there. And so my um, recommendation is to do the library research consistently and periodically, but with moderation. Okay, why do, why do I say with moderation? Because it's, with Google Scholar, you can find a lot of papers on something within a couple of hours, okay? I like to do that again and again, maybe on a scale of, of six times a year, okay? The problem is if you try to put 20 hours in at the beginning, you won't know how to read the papers and you, you'll miss things and you, you can't really, you, they're just not that much there until you expand your skill and get to the full face. And, and then you can do more research, okay? So I think many people make the mistake of not doing the library research at all, right? They don't, so they waste time in the laboratory when an hour in the, on Google Scholar would, would have solved the problem for them because it's more fun to be in the library. Well, they waste time the soldering stuff when they could have Googled a bottle circuit or something instead of... It's, I mean, it, it, it happens to all of us. But then let me warn you on the other side of something that, that it, it's happened to me at least 10 times in my life, okay? You will have an idea and you'll mention it at a party and someone will say, oh yeah, that's already been done. I heard about that, that that's been done. And you, for me, I used to have this like sinking feeling like, oh my God, you what? You know, my baby isn't original. You know, my research idea has already been done. But 19 out of 20 times, when you look up the paper the person is talking about, it's unrelated or it barely overlaps what you want to do or something. And so you, you need to be really cautious when someone tells you something has already been done. In my experience, usually it hasn't, okay? Especially not if you've done your library research. 
Okay, now there may be exceptions. Maybe one time in 20 or one time in 10, that's really true. And that's usually because the research is under a word that you didn't know it was under, right? So you Google search it, you didn't find anything because you didn't know it was called biomimicry or you know, what, whatever the terms are. You didn't know that, and so you didn't, you didn't find it. Okay, so I'm, I'm almost done. Um, uh, failed projects are very beneficial. At Public Invention, we publish everything, including our failed projects. Um, usually, sadly, if you fail, if, if something doesn't work, you can't get a paper out of it, it's like a peer-reviewed paper. What we do is we publish it in Medium or GitHub in that case. And we, because working in the light means you show people what went wrong. And that can be very, very valuable to people who want to stand on your shoulders. Even if your shoulders aren't very high, you just say, I tried this, it didn't work. That is useful. Now, it doesn't mean that they won't be successful. You might have failed for a number of reasons. They might be personal reasons, or it might be because the problem's harder than you thought, but it's worth showing that to people. Anything is worth doing is worth doing badly. That's a saying of Benjamin Franklin. I personally believe that. What that means is, like for example, Avinash and I worked really hard using surface, to do surface mount device soldering, and it was, it was miserable. And we, we never got, we had a 64 pin multiplexer chip. We never got it to work. And we worked, for, how many times did we do it? Five, like I bought five samples and we destroyed we all, burn all trying away. to get it to work, and then we never got it to work. But we learned surface mount device really well. A lot of good things came out of the work that we did. I hope he, I'm not mad at me for that. Um, okay, almost always in the modern world, you should learn to use Git, GitHub, and GitLab. Okay, computer scientists, that's sort of built in. For biologists and mechanical engineers, that not, might not be the case, but it's really a coming wave that you you, you, you need to understand. It's a very valuable technology. Um, I like to be open from the first day or from the first hour. So here's the way Public Invention starts a project. We create a GitHub uh, repository. We put a readme in there, and sometimes I even create an empty LaTeX paper. The paper has nothing in it. I just create a LaTeX paper because I know I'm going to write this up as a paper. Even if I never get to it, writing it up as a paper is the point. Right, like there's no point if I don't publish it. So if I, if it's something, not every project deserves a peer-reviewed paper. Like I made a, I used a pizza cutter to make um, very fine lines on oil paintings that didn't really deserve peer-reviewed paper. But nonetheless, some things do, and so I just created a LaTeX thing in the first place. For those of you who don't know, LaTeX is a professional typesetting system used mostly, mostly by mathematicians, also electrical engineers, bio, biologists, and doctors medical doctors don't seem to use it. Uh, and they're really missing out. The word stinks if you're using equations. It has other good things, but it, for equations, it's awful. Um, okay, you can never know too much math or too much programming. Now, it could be that this is an inherent bias in myself, but I don't really think so. Even if you're a biologist, if you know math and programming, you have like a superpower compared to other biologists, okay? It's just the case that computers are such a useful tool that knowing how to program a little is kind of like knowing how to write with a pencil, right? Like if you don't know how to write with a pencil, you're handicapped. If you don't know how to program at all, you are handicapped. Now, I can't draw like a professional artist. Many of you, it doesn't make sense for everyone to be a professional programmer, right? Even, even I'm not a professional programmer because I'm more of a manager. But nonetheless, knowing a little bit of programming is incredibly valuable. So I think everybody should learn that. And math is exactly the same way. Even if it's only used for statistics or modeling or even your own personal finances, everyone should know some math and the more the better. I really don't think you, you can know too much of math, no matter what field you're in. Um, and I know this makes me sound like a bigot, but stay away from Microsoft Windows if you can, if you can afford it. Your life will be much easier if you use Linux or a Unix-based system like, like Macintosh. Just don't go where Windows is and don't be convinced <laughs> by the nice ads that they, they make. It, as an engineer or anyone doing serious work, it's, it, it makes your life extraordinarily difficult. Um, and then, um, 
finally follow well-educated hunches. So the, the thing is, you don't have a right to have a hunch if you haven't done the work. But then once you have done the work, you do have a right to have a hunch. And you should have confidence in yourself once you have put in some time in the library and, and done some work on things. Okay, so that ends my...